Hi, I'm Rob Stauffer. I'm a senior production consultant for Side Effects out of the Santa Monica office. Today, we're going to talk about creating assets and creating variations on those assets procedurally in Houdini. Uh, we'll also take a look at ways to batch process those assets to get more results and to get those results faster. Um, if you are new to Houdini, I suggest that you check out uh, the Houdini Foundations video from Robert McGee um, for some basic concepts. So let's take a look at building a procedural asset. We're just going to start off with a simple box model here. Um, I want to point out that you know Houdini is not just about the nodes. You can do a fair amount of work in the viewport as I'm doing here. Um, you can select faces, select points. Um, once you select those faces, you can make adjustments, you can move things around, um, you can add a poly extrude, um, you can pull handles to adjust the look of that poly extrude, and so you're working similar to how you would in other DCC packages. But that being said, you notice that on the right side that a node for that poly extrude is added for you. And then if we select another face and extrude that geometry, we're getting a new node um, is added once again. Um, so again, this is that history that I'm talking about. Uh, we can, um, so once we have sort of a base for our, we're gonna build a, a, a road barrier, we can bring in some other objects. Um, these are just objects I got from another scene that I'm going to use to sort of cut holes um, into our geometry using our um, Boolean SOP, um, which was rewritten just a couple of versions ago and is extremely fast and efficient and does a really nice job. Um, and from here, we're just going to add a poly bevel to kind of give our, our objects some nicer edges. Um, and then we can do things like bring in uh, some operators to make sure we have good normals um, and so on to, to give us a nice base model. Uh, but as you see, I can go back to any point in that network and start making modifications. I can change how I do the poly extrude. I can change uh, the different sizes and, and, and edges of the geometry. Um, so there again, we're, we're, we have a history to go back and work from and make variations. Um, so now I want to take this pristine looking model and I want to start breaking it up a bit and adding some variation. Um, for this, we're going to uh, use a mountain saw, so which is really just basically adding some 3D point noise and I'm adding it to the current point positions of the geometry to break it up a bit. Um, we set some of those parameters to get some good basic noise to start with. So once we have that, um, you know, we want to take a look at some variations. Now there's a number of ways that we could do this. Um, one simple way is to just move some sliders around and then once we say, see something we like, we can just write that geometry out. Or as you see here, I can put in a simple frame expression that's going to use the frame number to drive the offset um, of the noise. And I can do that in a couple different places and add a multiplier. Um, so using this method, I could very easily and quickly get some variations to my, to my road barrier, but it's a little linear. And if I wanted to change um, a lot of those parameters, or I wanted to get really be able to truly see um, the different variations I have, it would be a tedious process to go in and add expressions everywhere for everything I want to change or to keyframe it. Um, th that could get really complicated. Um, so that's where our wedge drop comes into play. Um, so for uh, I like to think of the wedge drop if you're familiar with how uh, bracketing exposure on a camera would work, um, where you pick um, a bottom range and a top range and the number of brackets and then the, the DSLR for you is going to take those exposures. And uh, um, so our, well, our, our wedge drop works in a similar fashion. It allows you to select the parameters or channels that you want to change. Um, you give them a name, you give them a range, uh, you specify how many samples you want to do within that range. Um, and you can choose as many as you like. And you can, as we'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at some of the different ways that we can use the wedge drop to get different um, variations. The wedge drop exists as one of our rendering operators. So um, you do need to give it sort of a destination. Um, so in this case, we're going to use an OpenGL. You'll see later that, that we could also use write out to geometry or things like that. But in this case, we're, we're going to write out to um, the viewport, to a, a, a flipbook. Um, and as I mentioned, you can add, uh, we're going to add two parameters. We can use um, a height parameter. We're going to reference that mountain sop that we looked at uh, 
a few uh, minutes ago and we're going to change the height and then you just specify that range you specify the bottom and the top end of the range and the number of samples or steps in between that you want to take um, we also are going to maybe change the offset in x and again we're going to point to that mountain top um, surface operators for those of you that aren't familiar with houdini um, and we're going to set a bottom range and a top range for that and we're going to set the number of samples and so in this case we're going to do four by four so what that's going to give us, that 4x4 four four is going to give us 16 different varieties um, of, of this barrier. So we'll flip through them right here and it happens fairly quickly. And we see the noise values changing and we're going to get in those 16, it is, it is sampling each combination possible um, of, that four by, of those four samples per parameter. So let's first look at wedge random samples. Um, the way this works is you set the total number of samples. Um, you still specify your parameters and give them a range, uh, but you're not specifying any steps in between. And so what it does instead is it takes that total number of samples that you want and then randomly samples each parameter um, per iteration. So you're still going to end up with just a total of 50 samples um, that Houdini that randomly chooses from the range of each parameter. Let's take a look at this in action. Uh, so we have a sword digital asset here. Um, so you'll see there's a number of parameters. Um, it's built similar to that pipe asset we looked at to the, in the beginning. Um, there's some check boxes in there, which I should point out um, are also wedgeable because those point those check boxes have a value of zero or one. Um, and each of the locations within a, our ramp um, parameters there are um, accessible with the wedge wrap. Um, so what we did here is we got those 50 samples um, and I have nine parameters that I loop through and I get 50 samples of my sword asset and this is that was running in real time uh, so that uh, was not sped up at all so there's our 50 samples of that sword now we'll look again at the wedge by step which was uh, we quickly did with our road barrier and again uh, you specify the um, number of parameters and the range of each parameter um, in this case, you do have to specify the steps. Um, but like I mentioned, um, everything is accessible uh, within the wedge wrap. Um, so you don't have to have equal number of steps um, per parameter. So for example, for the checkbox, it's only a value of zero or one. So you're only gonna want one or two steps in between. Uh, you don't need six steps or four steps. Um, so you can go in and set how many steps you want for each parameter and run through that. In this case, I have nine parameters and the steps vary from two to three, uh, maybe a few, uh, I think three is the max. Um, so this is not quite running real time. Um, we'll look through um, all of our uh, variations now. Um, I did, this took about eight minutes to run, but I did get 1,296 variations out of um, wedging this sword. Uh, so that's, I'm sure it's a little bit of overkill, um, but I was able to do that in just eight minutes. The last method I wanna talk about is wedge by take. Um, so before I can really get into talking about this, so I gotta talk a little bit about takes for those of you that are not familiar with takes. So the way a take works is I can create, I have my main setup, which would be my main take, and I can add a take and what that does is allow me to select the parameters that I wanna change. And it doesn't change my core, my, my original or my base network, my main take. Um, what it does is it just adds the parameters I choose to that take. And when you, and, and so it allows you to make many variations with keeping that original setup intact. Um, there's a number of ways you see, I just turned on add uh, auto take. So that way, every time I move a slider, you see it changes from that sort of grayish brown color to black, which means it is now active or in the take. And you can see that that parameter is being added on the right hand side of my take window. Um, without auto takes, you would have to manually add that take by hand. Um, but again, what I can do is I can go in and using the main take as my base, I could go in and keep adding takes and making variations while still keeping that main take intact or my main setup. And then at any point in time down the line, once I decide on a take that I like, I can drag that take up to my main take and overwrite all those parameters. And then that now becomes the base or my main take. 
And so in the case of using the wedge drop, the way that works is you simply set it to um, render wedges or the wedge method to be by take. So all that does is that's really just an easy way to dump out each take that you have. So you select the base take and it'll, and it'll subsequently um, bake out or render out um, the takes that you have created underneath that. So this is a little bit more of an organized way. There's less, um, less randomness to it. Um, you know, it's not pulling steps in between. It's something that you may have made some variations by hand based on some notes. And then you just want to very quickly um, get those those exam those variations out. And if you think about it, um, it's a little bit of an easier way to manage as opposed to maybe saving multiple versions of a file or cutting and pasting different swords and then deciding on which sword that you like because it makes it a little bit easier to mis mix and match things and, and keep things sort of um, in check. So we can expand all of these workflows to encompass multiple ports parts of the pipeline. Um, you know, that same barrier asset that we saw earlier, um, if you look on the left-hand side of the screen there, that's our SOP network that's expanded a little bit. Um, and then we can have that uh, drive some textures that get dumped out. And those textures then are processed a little bit to make some texture maps that are then read back into your object and used as material and then written out. And they can be rendered to a viewport and you could also write out that geometry. And if you see on the right hand side, all of this can be merged together in our render output drivers very easily so that that'll run sequentially. So it'll do the bake, then it'll write out the color maps, it'll render a frame for you, and then write out that geometry. And that's simple as piping it into our merge wrap in our render context. Um, and then you can add a wedge wrap underneath that. And that wedge wrap will do the same thing and it'll run through all of those once before going to the next iteration. And we have some variables included that are wedge and wedge number. And what that wedge does is that allows you to see the results of your wedging. So that means any parameter, it's gonna include that value there. And what wedge number does is that's the iteration for you. So you can use those as a, um, uh, as a you know a ID number for writing out geometry so barrier one barrier two barrier three would be wedge one two and three um, so here's a quick look at writing out that geometry so that's that my barrier asset that was written out um, you know 16 times writing out those textures changing the noise values on the geometry all of that drove those texture maps and this is the result that I get so as we looked at the sword asset and looked at something like this, some of this could take time. That sword asset wasn't real time. It took eight minutes to do. Um, that might be too long. If you had more variations or a more complicated asset, it could take very longer. So what do we do about that? Well, we have what's called HQ, which is our, our farm, our farm manager. Um, you know, things like render farms are most often talked about in film and visual effects when you're when you have long simulations or, or sequences of renders that you have to dump on multiple machines. Um, but we can use this with our in conjunction with our wedge drop to take all of those different variations and all of those variations can be dumped to every available CPU that you have. So in the case of that 1,296 variations, well, if you had all of those, if you had 1,000 296 CPUs to use, well, you could render them all at once. Um, so it, uh, using things like HQ or an, and, a, and a compute farm makes it a little bit more feasible to do this many variations and there's an easy way to set it up procedurally in Houdini. Um, the other thing that we have is um, we have some ways that we can do things like use a variable called op digits with some of our um, assets, which makes it very easy to reference the number of the object. And then it very quickly pulls in all of the objects that you have written out using that, that delineator. So um, that number that you added from WedgeDOM, now that gets used to just automatically pull in those files for you. It makes it very easy to quickly duplicate some of these things. And we have some tool sets as part of our game dev tool shelf. You see here um, this quickly wrote out um, geometry and JPEGs for all of those things using a create thumbnails tool that um, will be one day part of our game dev tool shelf. Um, well, what now? We have a lot of variations that we like. What do we do with those? We have another thing that's part of our game dev tool shelf is our game, game dev LOD hierarchy tool. 
But what that does, the same way I brought in all of those barriers as you saw a moment ago, um, I can merge those into our LOD generator and that'll write out an FBX with all of those LODs inside of it for me. Um, so that way you're saving one FBX with each LOD instead of being used as an LOD in the traditional sense, it's being used as just a variation. And what I can do that is, with that is bring it into Unreal, for example, and in Unreal in the Mesh Editor, um, I can use those same numbers that are attached now to the LODs. I can um, create some materials based on the uh, textures that were written out that also have matching IDs, and then create and, and then just use the LOD tool inside of the Mesh um, Editor to pick which um, barrier I want to use, and it'll use the appropriate material as well. Or you could experiment with things like, you know, creating an asset that and a material that randomly generates um, or chooses which material it wants to use based on the asset. And as you move it around, it's going to randomly um, select the materials. Um, this was just a fun little experiment that I tried that uh, someone showed me how to do. Um, so as I mentioned before, we're not limited to geometry or, 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 or that, anything like that. We can use these in simulations. Um, if you see, I mentioned the wedge parameter before. If you see at the bottom, or the wedge variable, um, you see at the bottom there, uh, the um, text at the bottom of the viewport is, being, is using that dollar wedge to show me what the val values are that I'm changing in the sim. In this particular case, um, I'm doing a very quick um, sim, so it's not taking very long to do each frame. Um, so I'm cooking through each one of these, but I'm getting a chance to see the different temperature uh, diffusion and cooling rate of this pyro sim. So I get an idea of what I want to use for my final simulation. I can take those images into our compositing network and using our mosaic node, I can create a very quick proof sheet of all of the different variations that I have. Um, of those sim values so I can very quickly choose what it is that um, I want to use or I can show it to a director or supervisor or, or whatever you need to do. Um, the same applies for things like Voronoi fracturing you see again in the upper left hand corner so that way um, is the wedge value so that way if I want to once I have chosen which Voronoi fracture pattern I want to use I can see what the values are and plug those in um, as my final values. Um, a lot of the uh, tools that I use today in today's presentation uh, came from our game development tool set. Uh, there's a website there. Uh, you can download the tool set from GitHub. I also want to thank Louise, Mike, and Paul who've done a great job in developing these tools. Um, and they also um, are great about updating and responding to user feedback. And um, that's all for me for today. Thanks.